Very good. Well, hello from Townsville, North Queensland, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Um, today, I'm going to try and bring together quite a few different publications together to, in order to try and tell a big picture story on tracking sediment from the catchment to reef. And this is not just me, this is a work from many scientists um, from where I'm at at Tropwater James Cook University, as well as scientists at CSIRO, Australian Institute of Marine Science, Griffith University, etc. So I guess traditionally when we look at um, when we look at the um, catchment to reef conceptual model, I guess in the past we've always kind of thought of sediment uh, while the rain falling in the paddock, the sediment eroding from the paddock into the smaller tributaries, then into the larger rivers, to the end of the river and then out to sea where it may have some impacts um, on the environment downstream. So pretty much as the where the water's flowing from the catchment out to sea. A few years ago, um, colleagues from CSIRA sort of started to question that to say, well, actually, maybe we should be going the other way around. So we should be looking whether there's an impact on the marine environment first, if that's our end member, and then defining that impact and defining what the sediment is that's causing that impact. So then we can trace that sediment back up to a paddock source. So we, um, and then we can manage that source a lot better. So we feel that's probably the best approach um, really. And that's pretty much what the order of my talk's going to be in. So just <clears throat> the real um, study area up here is the Burdekin River, which is in the Great Barrier Reef catchment area. Uh, why are we interested in the Burdekin? Well, this is the biggest single source sediment contributor to the marine environment in the Great Barrier Reef. Here, this is the end of the catchment at the Burdekin Bridge. It's a really nice sampling site for us. We're looking up into this massive catchment area, 130,000 square kilometres of catchment area, which is about the same size as, Eng as England. Um, here, the, the, um, cat the river channel is about a kilometre wide. So um, it's a very big catchment area. We have a, a, a large dam that regulates 88% of the catchment area that I'll, I'll briefly touch on there. We've done a lot of work looking at how much sediment's being trapped in the dam. Um, and we're basically doing our sampling. So across the catchment to the reef. So we are sampling the tributaries well up into this catchment area, as well as I'll show you in a moment, um, further downstream when the river's flooding, looking at the flood plumes and looking at the sediment regimes uh, on the inshore areas of the Great Barrier Reef. We've also had to um, look at our methods a lot more over the years as well. So, you know, for example, you can see we're taking that bucket of water in the middle of the stream but you know, how representative is that water, um, is that sediment sample compared to how huge that stream is? Well, we have actually have done sampling across that stream profile and through the water column to show that the sediment is actually very well mixed at this point of the stream. So, and there'll be a few other little um, things I'll talk about in a moment about some of our method development. So starting off, we'll look at the impacts of sediment in the marine environment. So when we have these big floods from the Burdekin River, we tend to see quite spectacular images um, from space. So we have satellite images that show uh, where the floodwaters from the Burdekin River are heading in the marine environment. So I'm based here in Townsville. This is Magnetic Island for some of you that um, know this area. And here's the mouth of the Burdekin here. We've just sampled it around about here at the end of the bridge. And now we can start seeing it offshore. So that we tend to see when we have a big Burdekin flood, uh, very turbid waters just off the mouth of the river and the water plume, flood plume waters tend to move northwards up the coast. And then we can see the mid and outer shelves of the Great Barrier Reef further offshore. <clears throat> In 2019, we had quite a big flood from the Burdekin and we just happened to go um, out offshore out to Old Reef. So I'll just, our Old Reef is just um, out here. And we got a helicopter and we went out. We just happened to capture the plume front orders moving directly over a mid shelf reef on the Great Barrier Reef. So it captured some really nice images where you can see very clearly the turbid plume orders of the Burdekin River going out over Old Reef. And in that particular time, we went out a couple of days later on a boat and we managed to get some samples, sediment samples from those waters to characterise that sediment a bit better as well. But what are the effects of these newly delivered sediment um, delivered 
out into the Great Barrier Reef. And I'll have to spend a little bit of time on this. This is work from Katerina Fabricius and colleagues. Katerina's at the Australian Institute of Marine Science. Um, this is the burdock and discharge in a typical dry year and burdock and discharge in a typical wet year. So sorry, I think I forgot it this earlier when I was talking about the burdock and the, the load averages about 4 million tonnes per year, but in a dry year, it might be as low as 100,000 tonnes. In a wet year, it might be as high as 16 million tonnes. So it's a huge um, interannual variability for the burdock. And so this is a typical dry year. And what they looked at is a measure of photic depth. So this is the, uh, the depth where light can reach the bottom of the sea floor for where someone like a, a coral or a seagrass meadow might be growing and whether they've got, they have enough light or they don't. And this is a measure via satellite measures. And you can see in a typical dry sea, uh, dry period for the burdock and the photic depth starts on average at about 15 metres. It declines naturally during the wet season, which in, in this uh, part of the world is around December to April. Um, it drops out at about 10 metres and then increases back up to around that 15 metre mark. However, in a wet season, we see the photic depth falling much greater down to more like on average about seven metres and it stays prolonged um, low for us several months before it starts to rebound. So I guess the message here is if you're a seagrass meadow or a coral growing at nine metres, in a dry year from the burdock and you've got enough light all year round, but if you're in a wet year, you potentially have not, not enough light um, to meet your requirements for several months, which might be enough to knock you over. <clears throat> so we've also been recently doing some work to tr try and provide some more empirical measurements to support that satellite photic depth data, where we've set up an array of um, a nephilometer logger, looking at turbidity and pressure and other measurements, as well as sediment traps and things like that. And this is what the um, a time series data look like. I'm not going to go into it in a great detail, but the message here is we see this is the um, discharge of the Burdick and River. Here's the, that big 2019 flood. This is a measure of suspended sediment concentration. You can see uh, very high suspended sediment concentrations generally coinciding with the Burdick and floods. Not always. This was a big resuspension event that just happened before the big 2019 floods. Um, this is a measure of pressure, so when we would expect resuspension sediments uh, in, at this site. Um, this is light, so when you can see we have high sediment concentrations, we have zero light. I mean, the 2019 floods, this is about a period of three weeks with no light. And this is how much material we were accumulating in our sediment traps over those periods of deployment. I guess the key message here is not only do we see the highest suspended sediment concentrations coinciding with the river floods, and the light dropping out to zero. But we also see very high suspended sediment concentrations in the period after the flood. So this is the delivery of new sediment that's still swishing around the system, causing high suspended sediment concentrations and low light in the months period afterwards, which seems to support the previous work of the Fabricius et al study. What does this mean really for Cleveland Bay? Well, that um, logger site was a seagrass meadow area within the middle of Cleveland Bay at about five metres depth. And this is the seagrass meadow area. This is an older study now, but five consecutive years of how the seagrass meadow area has changed in Cleveland Bay. So we have the different colours represent the different seagrass species, and obviously the colours represent the area. So our hypothesis would be in these big uh, flood years from the Burdekin, we would see the photic depth being reduced and we'd see a contraction of the seagrass meadow area um, as um, it contracts back to a shallower areas, which we seem to see. So 2007, we had a drought breaking flood from the Burdekin and then we followed by, this was followed by very massive floods from the Burdekin in 2008, 2009 and 2011. <clears throat> and in 2011, we also had um, tropical cyclone Yasi, which was a big cyclone up here, which wiped out all the shallow seagrass meadows as well. So we had virtually little seagrass meadows, which then had quite big knock-on effects for um, dugongs and turtles. <clears throat> so that's defined what the impacts in the marine environment. Let's look at the transport and fate of sediment um, that we know about from the Burdekin. 
And for this study, we looked at sediment cores just off the mouth of the Burdekin where sedimentologists had told us or had previously documented these were the large sediment accumulation areas from the Burdekin River where sediment ended up. <clears throat> and here we took um, sediment cores and we did OSL dating on these sediment cores from a method that's been developed um, by Professor John Olley there. So here's a core two and a half metres long from Upstart Bay. We dated the bottom of that core to be 100 years old. This gives us accumulation rates of 25 millimetres per year, still actively accumulating. The site up here, we got um, in the last 200 years, the OSL ages gave us pretty consistent accumulation rates of just under 10 millimetres per year. And interestingly, that core went back a little bit further and between the 200 and 500 years ago, which is prior to the arrival of Europeans and the development of the Burdekin catchment, the accumulation rates were just below one millimetre per year. So about a tenfold increase in accumulation rate at that site. But then we also looked at this site where the sediments in the top part of the core were last deposited 1500 years ago. And the sediment in the top part of this core in Cleveland Bay were last deposited 4,000 years ago. And this actually then coincided very nicely with the avulsion history of the Burdekin River. So the Burdekin River mouth has never discharged always in this part of the bay. Um, it's, it's the, the uh, discharge there about in the last, over the last thousand years or so, but it also discharged in this area. And the last time it discharged in this vicinity was about 1500 years ago. And the last time it discharged in the vicinity of Cleveland Bay was 4,000 years ago. So that seemed to match and, um, up with um, the ages of these cores. And it also allowed us to refine our conceptual understanding of the fate of sediment in the marine environment. So most sediment falls out at the mouth here, about 80 to 90% of the sediment load from the Burdekin falls out there. And it doesn't move like Previously, the sedimentologists thought that this would be resuspended and moved up the coast, but that fine mud sized sediment, it doesn't appear that's the case. So the sediment that's causing the impact is the sediment that's being transported in the flood plumes, that 10 to 20% of the sediment. And it's that reaches sort of this area of our Cleveland Bay and our inshore coral reefs up here. This is what that sediment looks like. It looks quite different to the sediment that's come out of the mouth of the Burdekin River. However, we still see those individual particles that have come from the river and these range between one and 20 microns in size. These are the nice rounded opaque particles. That more translucent uh, material that you see is organic rich mucousy material, which is largely bacteria and fungi, which are feeding on the nutrients on those sediment particles. And we also see our zooplankton and other photoplankton casings starting to um, come in there as well. So with that knowledge, we started to target specific plume transects. And this is um, another nice aerial photo of the Burdekin plume. And just to give you an idea of what the sediment and the water looks like if we just took a bucket of water along our transect of sites up the coast. But I'd just like to draw your attention really to this Orchard Rock Savannah Island area where, you know, the water looks very clear. Like, so it's two milligrams per litre. The actual photic depth is still very suppressed here with um, still a lot of colour in the water, but quite low suspended sediment or suspended solid concentrations. However, if we've got a new device called the um, SETI pump, where it's essentially a filtration system where we can filter thousands of litres of water through a one micron filter. And with that material, we're able to um, recover enough sediment um, that we can do our characterization and tracing on. And previously we were never able to do that. So this is three hours of pumping with the SETI pump here now at these sites at Havana Island, which were, as you remember, half a milligram per liter at the surface and only two milligrams per liter at the surface at Orchard Rocks. We pump 10,000 liters in three hours and this is the sediment we've now recovered. Looks very similar to what we got at the Burdekin River Mouth. And we can start to look under the microscope and see the sediment flocks still very well preserved and the diatoms starting, the productivity starting to occur in the water. Interestingly, we can also pump at the depth to see if there's any difference between the surface and the depth. And you can see at this Orchard Rock site just off Magnetic Island there that there is no primary production because there's just not enough light getting to that depth. And that sort of work is ongoing. We're starting to do some more
physical and chemical tracing of that sediment. So moving on now to sediment sources in the catchment and how they've changed over time. Uh, we've actually been sampling the major tributaries of the Burdekin, um, and I'll bring up the, the large map of the 130,000 area catchment where the big tributary sites is this upper Burdekin area here, the Cape River, the Baliendo, the Sutter, and then the overflow of the Burdekin Falls Dam, and then this area below the dam. So just focusing on um, this panel on the left, we can actually look at the sediment load budgets of specific, specific particle sizes. So we've now defined that the sediment that travels the furthest in the marine environment is always less than 20 microns. So let's have a look at where that particular particle size fraction is coming from. And it turns out it's largely from this upper Burdekin catchment and the area below the Burdekin Dam. And we've done a lot of studies, a five year study, looking at the sediment coming into the Burdekin Dam and the sediment going over the Burdekin Dam and the different particle size fractions that are trapped within the dam. So we know how much of that material is also trapped. So it turns out it's roughly about a 50-50% contribution from the catchment area above the dam and the catchment area below the dam. Then moving on to this side, we've also had much finer scale um, studies on the verdict and catchment from our community monitoring program, largely landholders of graziers collecting samples from their catchment. And this also supported our story on the sediment contributions from this top part of the upper verdict and it's just refined it that little bit further to that top part of the upper verdict and, and really the Bowen, little Bowen tributaries of, in that area below the dam. And this holds up with the particle size as well. Colleagues from CSIRO have also looked at 10 beryllium isotopes, which provide a measure of how erosion rates have changed over time. So this can give you, the 10 beryllium can give you long-term erosion rates. And this is the data here that lo and behold show that the upper Burdekin and Bowen area below the dam were naturally the biggest sediment contributors as well. And when we look at the modern contribution of the sediment um, today, we've actually see these same sites or same tributaries produce the highest anthropogenic sediment contribution as well. That's where the largest increase has occurred. So we've defined that, what can we actually do about it? And what are the large erosion processes that are driving the sediment erosion in the Burdekin catchment? And here again, um, colleagues from CSIRO have been doing traces of fallout radionuclides, in particular cesium-137. Um, and it turns out there's very little cesium-137 in the sediments, uh, suspended sediments that we've been measuring um, that have been transported in the system, which tells us immediately that it's largely subsurface sources, um, erosion below about 15 centimetres below the soil profile. Um, and mainly those erosion sources are predominantly um, channel erosion through either gully and stream bank erosion, they seem to be the dominant sources. However, the squalls are still a significant um, contribution, particularly um, in the dry years where we have more lower ground cover. Um, and some of the studies have started to suggest now that gullies contribute about 40% of the fine sediment export, not just from the Burdekin, but for the entire Great Barrier Reef catchment area, <coughs> area from about 0.1% of the grazing land. So what can we do about it? Um, for hill slope erosion, it's about maintaining the ground cover, but this also it helps um, the hydrological function of the landscape and reduces that surface runoff, which then can go on and increase um, gully erosion, um, fencing off some of the bare areas and looking at the excess runoff that fuels the channel erosion for the hydrological function. Stephen. For these smaller, sorry, yeah. Stephen, just to, sorry to interrupt, I just left you a note that you're, there's 15 minutes are up, so you've got five minutes to kind of finish up and answer questions. So just letting you know the time. No worries, Ben, I'm just about to finish up, mate. Oh, so great. not too far off. Um, so these are the smaller gullies, which is sort of a head cut. So reducing the flow of water into there um, and hopefully we can revegetate that or increasing some of the roughness and allowing vegetation to start um, taking over, which um, helps reduce that um, gully from eroding. We have these massive alluvial style gullies and colleagues from CSR, IRO, Griffith University and Granning Australia have been doing a lot of recent work in this area below the dam, which 
of the Burdekin Dam, which is only 12% of the area. Um, these are what the alluvial gullies look like. They essentially get a mine site rehabilitation type approach to them. So these are the before and after shots where we've leveled the ground. Um, they put rock shoots in, they treat the soil with gypsum and mulch and things like that. So that's an example of Mount Wickham. This is um, an example at Strathalbyn Station where they put the mulch in and um, completely remediated that landscape. So now a gully that might have been contributing about a thousand tonnes a year is effectively contributing nothing. So final slide is what do we know? It's really this organic and nutrient rich sediment um, that's less than 20 micron um, is the most significant impacts on the Great Barrier Reef, particularly on water clarity. Um, this anthropogenic sediments is derived largely from subsurface and um, scrawl surfaces. <clears throat> um, and to reduce the uh, amount of erosion, um, reduce our sediment loads, we need greater than 40% cover to reduce the sediment loss from hill slopes. But we particularly argue for that greater than 70% ground cover to provide that eco-hydrological function and reduce that amount of surface water flow. And just to note there, well, there will be time lags in the system that may you know, take a lot longer than what we would like um, to have those sort of impacts. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you for having me again and happy to answer any questions if I've still got some time.